I remember a comment that was made to me about 10 years ago. It was from a parishioner. She had come in to talk about some troubling things in her life, some family issues, financial woes, even some depression. And as we were talking, she made a comment. She said, you know, I'm finally starting to believe you. Me, I'm like, what? She says, well, for a long time, you have been talking about hope and joy, and you always seem so chipper. And I've been thinking, yeah, his life is so easy. Of course, he can be hopeful. But then she said, because of these recent attacks upon you of late, and you still continue to talk about joy and hope, maybe what you say has some merit. You see, 10 years ago, when we merged as a parish, it wasn't all smooth. There were a lot of people who were really upset about the merge. I think basically they were fearful of what would happen. Fear is powerful. Now, fear, as has been said, is a herald of revolutions and is an instructor of great ignorance. What happened is at the time, there were a lot of these anonymous letters that went out. They weren't to me, but they were about me. We had a lot of people attacking our staff, our pastoral council, our transition team, you know, accusing them of a lot of things, spreading a lot of gossip. And I get it, because the whole idea of changing is tough. When Bishop Kinney told us to merge as a parish, we were the first ones in this diocese. And for a lot of people, they're thinking, we don't need to merge. We've got plenty of priests. There's nothing we have to change. Well, they were wrong. And they continue to be wrong. As a matter of fact, that's going to be very apparent in the next couple of years. Because this summer, we have four of our priests retiring. And next summer, we could have six retiring. We only have three people being ordained this year and one next year. So there's always going to be this void. We're never going to catch up. But indeed, when we were invited to merge, and even with all that bad stuff happening, I believe it was one of the best things that ever happened to our parish. Because we had to make a decision about who we are and who we want to become as a parish. In many ways, we did as the early church was doing in the first reading, saying we want to be a people of great joy. Or as St. Peter talked about in the second reading, that indeed we want to give them a reason for our hope. Because indeed, we decided as a people who we should be Many people, well, I should say many, some left. Most people stayed with and said, yes, we want to be here. And for the 342 households who have joined our parish since we merged 10 years ago, we continue to grow and say, we want to be a Vatican II parish. A parish, as you can see from this big banner behind us, we put that together last November. That we pledge to be a kind and generous parish. By that means, that means that we pledge to be welcoming to all people. We pledge to like, have a leadership model that is not just a top-down, but really wants to listen to the voice of all and use consensus in making decisions. We want to be a parish that really acknowledges the, the role that women play in the church. That's apparent with our fantastic staff we have, but also Molly Wyrens, who reflects for us every once in a while, as she did about a month ago, hearing the voice of women from the altar. We also said that we want to be a parish who have vibrant liturgies. We really want to commit ourselves to having celebrations of joy and hopefulness. We said that we want to be a parish with a fo uh, focus on social concerns. So right now, we tithe 5% of what we make and we give them away to different organizations. 
We have a sister parish, St. Mary's in Red Lake. We continue to do things like the Christmas giving program, or help with a community meal. We continue to reach out to individuals and groups. We continue to focus on a strong youth program, and indeed have a faith formation program. We call it FIRE, Families in Religious Ed, where we want to educate not only just the kids, but also the adults. In a sense, we decided as a people of faith that we want to be a people filled with the Spirit. It's like Jesus talked about in the Gospel, where this is the second part, a continuation from last week's Gospel. This is called the Farewell Discourse, where Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's telling them that he's going to go away. So next Sunday, we're celebrating Ascension. And indeed, Jesus says, I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to have the Spirit with you to help you. And then Jesus defines the Spirit by two terms. He says the Holy Spirit is the Advocate. This is a term that was used back in the time of Jesus to be a person who would stand up for those who were accused of something. They would actually stand there at a trial, usually a person of notoriety. And just for that person standing by that accused, oftentimes it swayed the court where they say, wow, we really got to believe in that person. But it's as if Jesus is saying, the Spirit is going to be by you when you feel persecuted when you feel that things are not going well. We experience that when we merge together. But perhaps it's that same spirit who's guiding you now as you deal with the ramifications of this shutdown. If you deal with financial woes or sickness or ill health. Back then, 10 years ago, we said we have to trust the leadership of our diocese. We have to trust the Holy Spirit working through that leadership. Because we believe the Holy Spirit continues to work, not just in the time of Jesus, not just 10 years ago, but today with us. The second term that Jesus uses, he says, the Spirit of truth. That the Holy Spirit will guide us to truth. Recognizing who we are to be as a faith community and as individuals. To recognize that love is stronger than fear. Indeed, that mercy is more powerful than judgment. And that it's better to be inclusive than exclusive. I tell you, speaking for the entire staff, we miss you. We miss seeing you. We miss celebrating with you. But perhaps that we're all going to learn something from these shut down days and the dealing with this virus. Perhaps we learn about looking at life differently. Not to make it so complex, but really focus in on the simple things. I heard about a man recently who said, you know, there are kids playing in our creek by our house. We haven't had kids playing in that creek for decades. Perhaps we're all going to discover new ways of being, of living, of playing, of loving. We also recognize that as a family of faith, we celebrate the blessings of creation around us. About a month ago, was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Perhaps one of the things we can learn is not to take any creation or nature for granted. That indeed we are called not to be the masters of nature and creation, but to be people who coexist. This weekend was to be a big celebration for our parish. As I said, our 10th anniversary we're going to really celebrate well, but you know, just as we started 10 years ago with some kind of rocky thoughts, perhaps it's that same idea of trusting the Spirit within us. So even though we can't celebrate as we want, church is bigger than a building. And Christ our light is wider than just our members, but it reaches out to all of you. 
your invitation to trust the Spirit working in your life. Trust the Spirit to be your advocate. Trust the Spirit to give you truth that perhaps whatever you face, whatever you have before you, you will find joy. You will give them a reason for your hope. And that you will be, as the Gospel said right at the end, you be the place where God's love is revealed.